So, yeah, now we're running. Good. Um, hello. I would like to introduce um, to talk about the microtrones in the in the year in the 60s, 70s, 80s. You know, you could have found those at James Bond. Now you have them in Berlin, and um, I'm pleased to introduce Mr. Miller and uh, Drun, mm -hmm. and uh, they're going to teach you how to build your own microtron. Okay, give them a warm thank you. Uh, welcome. <laughs> Thanks. So um, you, this is how the presentation will go. And you probably all know those UAVs that you can find in the news. They're quite pricey and they're used by the military mainly. So this one is a couple of million dollars expensive. And um, you also find some, some civil aircrafts, but still they're kind of pricey. This one is about one million dollar. It's used in Japan to um, spray crop with that. And um, you also find small aircrafts in the military, but still they're kind of pricey. So this one is about $50,000. And um, you find stuff that you can use to um, fly, which is not a real UAV like this one, which can just let go and, and fly. And there was just the question why we didn't use quadcopter, but we used fixed wing. I guess this is uh, what most people see as drones if you talk about homemade drones today. Uh, we took a little other approach. We have fixed wing aircrafts like these two. We also have some quad rotors, but mainly we're doing fixed wing aircraft and why we do that, we're gonna talk about that later. So if you decide to build your own drone, um, what do you need? What's the, the skills? What's the main skills you need to, to start with the whole thing? The first thing people think about is the aircraft itself. It's an important thing, but um, you should not put too much effort into the aircraft itself. You should know how, why an aircraft flies, and you should get a good aircraft, but don't start with a small aircraft. Don't start with a fast aircraft. Take a big, slow-moving, big inertia aircraft that flies very well. and. Um, don't start with the small ones right away. You probably have some control loops that you have, which you will use to control the aircraft and the autopilot. You have to push all this um, information, all these formulas into some computer. You have to have some knowledge in computer software and how you operate that. And you put that into software. Then you have to put this software into the aircraft. You have to have some hardware, some electronics. You probably need some skills uh, on how to operate a GPS receiver, how to integrate antennas, and you probably also have to make sure that the telemetry link or the video link doesn't disturb the GPS, because um, that's most likely the biggest problem you will have, especially if you have such small aircrafts that you um, have a lot of interference between the devices that you have in the aircraft. Finally, you also need RC skills, because the first thing the aircraft will do is it will not work. So you will need some skills to fly it, and even if you're like 500 meters high and flying slow, some strange thing will happen. So um, you need some RC skills, or even better, you have to know someone that has RC skills who can do the security pilot for you. And that's how we do it all the time. We have one person operating the aircraft on the ground, and we have one security pilot just responsible for the security, and all he will do is look at the aircraft, and he, if he doesn't like it, he will just switch over to manual and control it. And all this, paparazzi, we have a lot of team members from various fields. We have people that can build aircraft, and people that do electronics. We have skilled RC people on the team. So we're not just from, from one region, but we try to combine all of them. My turn? Okay, so when you... Turn it on? I'm on. Okay. Is it working? Yeah, when you speak about UAV, usually what people will see is the vehicle itself. Uh, the vehicle is only a very small part of the system, and if you are going to do autonomous flight, you have to um, involve a much bigger system. 
So the first thing you will want to fly the aircraft is what you find on a normal OB aircraft is a standard RC link. And then comes the big part, which is your ground segment. So you will have a data link and a, you will need a data link and a ground control station to see what happens in the aircraft. And uh, yeah, the only point is, the only problem is not to fly it. Uh, before you fly, you will need to prepare your flight, so define your mission. Uh, you will obviously need to be able to do some simulation because you don't want to rebuild an aircraft every time you made a coding error. You will need to be able to tune your aircraft every time you mount the autopilot on a new aircraft. It, mine, it will need to be adjusted to this particular aircraft, so plot, curve, see how the you know, fine-tune the autopilot. Then when you're, f when, when you're flying, also the aircraft is autonomous, you will need to monitor what it's doing and maybe interact with him, change some part of the flight plan. And then when you've landed, you will want to be able to analyze, it, to analyze the flight log because obviously when you're flying, the workload is quite high and you haven't seen everything. So after the flight, you will want to Again, plot some data and see if everything went as you expected. So, the coolest thing about the aircraft is that they fly. So, we wanted to show you an aircraft in the air, but it's kind of difficult to fly in an urban area like uh, here in Berlin, and we couldn't find a place very close, so that would be kind of impossible. So, what we thought about is uh, we set up three locations where we have teams right now sitting there in the cold, waiting to start the aircraft. And what we try to do is we want to control the aircrafts flying fully autonomously in Hildesheim and Toulouse from here. So once they are launched, they're flying on their own. We have an aircraft about the size of the bigger red one and another one slightly bigger. And um, this is something very complicated, <laughs> even if it isn't look like, but it took us quite long to set this up. We just set this up for this event. We have never done it before. And um, so we're going to try to demonstrate that. Yes, yeah, so uh, before we go with the demonstration, we are going to just give a brief overview of uh, what you are going to see. Uh, then we'll have the flight demonstration. And then we'll come back uh, a little more in depth on what you see. So what you will see is um, aircraft flying in Hildesheim and in Toulouse, uh, flying their flight plan. So what is a flight plan? Uh, basically, a flight plan will, well, for the most simple, define a trajectory. So the most simple flight plan, you would have one or two waypoints defining a line, and the aircraft will fly along that line. Now, uh, if you're doing only lines, your aircraft will not fly very well. So you will want uh, slightly more complicated trajectories, like a circle around the waypoint. Once, uh, once you know how to fly a circle and to fly a line, you'll be able to combine that and fly patterns, like this figure of eight. So while our aircraft will fly, we will switch them to that kind of patterns. And uh, with all these... Uh, basic patterns, you can build a more complex trajectory, uh, like this uh, landing trajectory, where the aircraft will join a specific area, lose altitude, and then fly along uh, what we call a glide, and land on the runway. Um, so th these are a statically defined uh, trajectory, but in a flight plan, uh, this is uh, like a program, you are also well, in Paparazzi, you are also able to write a flight, pl flight plan like you write a program and define uh, complex behavior like the one we have here. In this uh, trajectory, the aircraft is as a, was fitted with a chemical sensor and is looking for uh, what we call plumes uh, and trying to find the source. So it is starting here. When it finds a plume, uh, it's flying in a cone, making it larger and larger. When you find another plume, it's doing again. 
And so this kind of behavior is uh, inspired by uh, biological behavior. This is the way insects do. Um, and so this is an example of, uh, of a complex flight plant. We'll see after that how you can define it. Right. So um, this is the ground station that we use. Uh, we just go barely over it. You'll see some map on the top. This is from Google Maps. And you see some waypoints, and you see two aircrafts, and you see two carrots, and the aircrafts try to follow the carrot. And uh, you have a primary flight display where you can see how the aircraft is flying, how it's operating in the air. You have some messages, like kill mode. If you switch off the engine, if something strange happens, you probably turn off the engine. And um, then we have two strips over here we're going to talk about later, where you directly um, can go to special flight plan points and use them. And monitor the flight parameters of the, of the aircraft. Yeah. You have like the voltage and the speed and the throttle and every information you need. And what you see in this sheet is that you have two aircraft at the same time. Um, that's what we're going to try now. We're not going to switch to Istanbul. We couldn't get a security pilot there. And security is always the most the biggest concern and whenever we fly and so we decided not to switch to, to Istanbul so we're going to have hopefully two aircrafts. The mission or the application in this case is simply video so we have a very small video camera that's the small thing on the bottom and a very small video transmitter which you see on the top and we're going to transmit video from the aircrafts and try to visualize the, the video, the live video from the aircraft here on the screen. Um, yeah, so I guess we've done, uh, we are done with a small uh, introductory presentation. And so now we will attempt to fly the aircraft. So we will switch computer. And, uh, so this is uh, the same ground station that we showed you before. Uh, this is the... Yeah. Purple aircraft, this is the aircraft that is in France, and the uh, yellow one is the aircraft that is uh, in, in design. So you see that the aircraft are in manual for now, and now we will contact the pilot and let them know that they can switch it to autonomous. So on the map, you see here this is the map in Toulouse, you see the, the aircraft here next to the pointer. And it will take off and hopefully go to fly a circle around the standby waypoint. So, uh, as you want. I see if they are ready. Uh, so they have completed the pre-flight check. I'm waiting for the aircraft to, so I'm switching to the takeoff block. Here you see the video of the, here you see the video of the aircraft. Um, here you see that in this flight plant I have switched to the takeoff block. Now I'm waiting for the security pilot to tell me that he's ready to throw. It will switch the aircraft to autonomous and uh, throw it. So once again, this is um, something very new and very challenging. You see him walking here on the video, holding the aircraft. So he has realized that I'm waiting for him to take off. So the pink one is in Toulouse, and the yellow one is in Hildesheim. Easy in auto too. Mm. And we are gone. Uh, hopefully. Hopefully we are gone. <laughs> yeah, I see that it should give throttle. Uh, yeah, 
So what we have here is a DSL connection. At the home, there's a house. And even though it doesn't look like, but you can get DSL in France, even if you look that far away from the city. And we have a DSL connection, so we have like 128 kilobits uplink where we send the telemetry and the video. And in Hildesheim, we have a UMTS phone on the ground, which gives a little less transfer rate. So the picture from there will be worse. And um, we have a complete system there. So there's a security pilot and there's a laptop and everything is set up so they can control the aircraft from here. And we just have a sneak entry to the, to the system so that we can see what they are doing and we can move waypoints or change the flight plan or do whatever we want. Okay, so the aircraft is now in air. You see it's giving 100% throttle and it's heading toward the standby circle where it will hopefully circle. Okay, so... Now what can we do? Do we want to start the second aircraft now? Or yeah. play with this one a little while they get ready? Yeah, maybe you play with this one a little. Okay, so you see that it's circling around this waypoint called standby. I will move the waypoint a little. And you see that I change the trajectory of the aircraft and is now going to fly over the circle. On the video you see my house in the middle of the field. Um, and here you see the aircraft flight parameter, so it's flying 100 meters above ground um, at uh, an airspeed of uh, 14 meters per second with half throttle. And everything is green, so I have no reason to worry. Uh, now what I can do is I will uh, ask him to go and perform a figure of eight uh, around the waypoint one. So the waypoint one is here. It's a bit far, but it uh, should be okay. And so we are gone. So you see here the flight plan block changed and the aircraft is defining a new trajectory. I'm checking that the altitude is correct. Yeah, it's flying, we're losing some of the messages. This is uh, not so common to do that through the network. So yeah. now I can leave it here. You see the video that is transmitted by the aircraft. And um, what I want to uh, underline is that uh, we only have the security pilot. Uh, with the security pilot in Toulouse, the only thing he did was to throw the aircraft for now we are controlling it from here, and so they are doing nothing uh, in Toulouse. So maybe we will leave this aircraft uh, to fly along this uh, figure of eight. Along this figure of eight. It, this aircraft has an endurance of 30 minutes, so this is perfect for uh, this demonstration. And we will start the second aircraft in uh, Ildesheim. Uh, so I will just quickly tell the security pilot that everything is okay and I'm going to uh so he told me to go to west because he has the sun in the eyes um, yeah, I moved to west. Ready? Yeah. Okay, so we are switching to... You want me to do it? Yeah. Uh, maybe. Okay. Yeah, we both. Yeah. Switch over to the other one. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. Ready? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the map of Germany. Uh, just why they take off. Uh, the map are downloaded uh, online from Google Map. 
So if you want to fly somewhere, you just need to throw your aircraft, and if you have a network connection, it will download the maps from Google Maps. Oh, and the video. Uh, this uh, aircraft has a... Mm -hmm. That's what I'm doing. So this aircraft is transmitting uh, its video through a GSM modem, a cell phone. So this is why it's not uh, refreshing very fast. This aircraft is not tuned very well, so you see the circle is not as accurate as the other one. But um, it's flying, and you also can see that the um, data rate is not as good as for the DSL, so we have a little more hiccups in the flight, but still you can see that it is sort of flying. Um, it's actually, we have a movable camera in this other aircraft, which you can probably barely see, but you can move this. And uh, unfortunately, we broke this when we tried two hours ago, so we cannot demonstrate that. But um, with this aircraft, you can fly over something and move the camera while you fly over it. So maybe going to demonstrate that next year. So the, the problem of uh, link is not very important because, as we said before, the aircraft is autonomous. So if we don't do nothing, it will just fly by itself. And we only need the link to be able to change his flight plan. So I'm reloading the video from the German aircraft, which is on this circle. You want me to... Yeah, maybe move the circle to stand by a little to the south. Ah, there you can see the airfield. These are the cars, this is the hut. They were able to warm a little bit in the hut. And... Um... Yeah, yeah. We're yeah. waiting for the confirmation. So what you do now, we send the aircraft the message to move the waypoint. And once we get the acknowledge from the aircraft that the waypoint is moved, the annoying beep stops. So we changed it. Uh, you want me to put it on a figure of eight or something? Yeah. Uh, so figure of eight around uh, waypoint one. Hmm? Let's go. So. I change the flight plan block. Yeah. Okay, so this figure of eight, of eight pattern is the one we use when we uh, need to do recognition on a, on a target because this is uh, the, the pattern that allows you to fly over a point uh, with different direction and uh, as often as possible. Uh, we'll talk. Uh, we'll talk uh, after about why we why we do that. Um, so what else? We could do plenty of things. You see that we have um, a flight plan with plenty of patterns. Uh, but yeah, I don't know how long we want to fly. Maybe go on with the talk. Hmm? Yeah. Maybe go on with the talk. Yeah. Okay. Because I've seen, I think you've uh, about seen what there is to see. We have an aircraft that fly autonomously. We have video. We are able to act on this flight plan. And yeah, that's about it. So maybe we tell the. So here we go back to Toulouse. You see that the oh yes, this was nice. You see that the trajectory are very uh, clean. Uh, I just I, I'll make uh, what we call a, a survey. So um, a survey uh, is a, a regular survey. Just make sure that the aircraft took the, the, the command. Yeah. Uh, no, no, everything is fine. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, so you see the point S1 and S2, and the aircraft will, do, will be performing a, a survey in the square between those two points. So I will move maybe this point a little 
here. And ah, crappy network. Okay. He went by to. Uh, maybe the security pilot is playing trick to me. <laughs> I went by to stand by. I said survey. So I put it back and go see what he says. So <laughs> for those who don't speak French, he said I put it back on standby because uh, he was flying south and I didn't understand what he was doing. Oops. <laughs> Flying all the way north. Uh, okay, I'm putting. I'm going back on standby. Two. Okay, maybe we won't play with the survey today. <laughs> and I'm going back to standby. So you see, he's turning back. Um, <laughs> So don't worry, uh, flying through network is not something that we usually do, but flying is something that we do very often and we are uh, quite comfortable with this. Uh, so everything is in control. <laughs> so we go on with the talk and start for the flight. Will you land? Should I yeah, go on? I tell him or maybe I go on. Okay, I'll just switch over. We have some more slides. Okay, so I told him now he can have it and land it. And so, okay, we'll talk. Um, so now we'll try to explain a little more in detail what we, what we demonstrated. So the, the aircraft uh, that were flying um, used the software and hardware uh, from a project called Paparazzi. So this project started uh, back in 2003. And on this slide, you can see the very, first, uh, the very first aircraft and the very first electronics. So we are not very proud about that but uh, it allowed us in uh, something like three to five months uh, to get an autonomous aircraft. Uh, and as Martin said, we used a large, stable, easy to fly aircraft and we used the simplest electronic we could. And yeah, in 2004, um, there was a new hardware developed which contained two AVR processors which had a little more power than the PIC. Uh, we have two processors, so one processor just does the RC and the other one does the navigation. So if you do fancy stuff in the navigation and the processor crashes, you'll still be able to fly it. So you see these two processors, you also see a modem and a, and a power supply. And we had shrink also the size of the aircraft uh, considerably. The first aircraft was 1.5 kilo, this one was 400 gram. And the first aircraft was 1.5 meter span, and this one is 65 centimeters. And 2005, um, more teams joined it. We have a team in, in the US and Arizona. That's the University of Arizona aircraft. And there's a team from Germany joining. So we had more people working on this, uh, uh, taking part in, in competitions. And uh, 2006, we had this tiny little aircraft, which is now made by a small company. This is the aircraft you see there. So this is 30 centimeter span, and as we'll uh, mention later, the, it's a very big challenge to shrink the size of the aircraft. And we have a new board design. It's an ARM7 based board with 60 megahertz, which is a little terrible because the processor is bored most of the time because just navigating is not doing much. So we had to add some applications to get the processor doing something. We also we also included a, a GPS on the board, so we had no external GPS anymore, but just this very small board with the power supply and the processor and the GPS all in one board, and it's like 24 grams and more than enough power. Yeah, this uh, we, had, we still had shrink the size. This aircraft weighs uh, a little less than 300 grams. Uh, this one is about 240. 250, 240. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
So 2007 then was the year where we got into the applications a little more. We um, did some tests with firefighters. We tried to detect a fire in southern France, so they started a fire. They were a little scared. We thought that they would burn half the forest, but all they did was this tiny little fire, so we were a little disappointed about that. <laughs> And what we also did, like in this year in August, we joined a meteorological survey in Iceland. So we were able to fly in real rough conditions. What you see there in the back is the Hofjuskil glacier. And we were doing test flights there to, to measure humidity, temperature, pressure, and trying to estimate the wind. So um, 2007 was the application and also was the year where we brought paparazzi to people using it. So we teach the meteorologists who fly the aircrafts how to fly them so that um, if it works well in um, March, they will be doing a, a drive with an icebreaker ship to the North Pole and they're probably going to use paparazzi aircraft for, for that. So what were the goals when we started all this? First thing was to keep it simple. So if you have the chance to use as few sensors, as few components as possible, you shall do that. So that's what we try. We try not to increase the whole system to have like a bunch of sensors and big computer power. We started small and then increased. So simplicity was a thing. It should be buildable. The whole thing, everything is open source. Everything you just saw flying, all the hardware, all the PCB, is everything is, is in the CVS. You can just check out and build your own boards and build the whole thing. That also means that we're not using any special parts or something. We're just using electronic components that you can get anywhere. It should be affordable. There's no sense in making one million aircrafts. Everybody can do that. So we try to make it as cheap as possible, using uh, expensive stuff only where it's really needed. And we try to be small. Like I said, it's uh, not that big problem to get big aircrafts flying autonomously. But this tiny little thing where you really have to throw it, like you probably have to be American to be able to throw it. We have some baseball training. So um, this is really small. And this comes to, due to the fact that the, the main motor of the whole project was competitions. We took part in a number of competitions to um, have some points at which you get things done like the networking flying we did today. We, we needed a day to get this done, and this were always the competitions. And for the competitions, we had always the 50 centimeter maximum. So that's why the red one is that size. It's exactly 50 centimeters, or it, it fills in a, a 50 centimeter cube. OK, my turn. I think we have to accelerate or we'll never make it. Yeah. So uh, one of the ways to uh, make uh, something affordable is to use a commercial off-the-shelf product as much as possible. So here you see uh, pictures of um, many commercial parts that we use in our UAVs. So as Martin said at the beginning, we don't build the aircraft most of the time by just regular hobby aircraft. Uh, we don't buy, build the computers, we don't build the RC links, the data links, we don't build the propulsion, and you can get uh, very good quality stuff for a very low price uh, in, consumer, uh, in consumer shops. Um, yeah, those slides are uh, here to demonstrate the difference between uh, normal Maybe air seater is not a good word, maybe uh, air COB aircraft and a UAV. So in a air COB aircraft, what you have is an airframe, uh, but this is an um, electric propulsion aircraft. So you have a battery, a radio control receiver, servos, and a motor. And now if you want to turn that into a UAV, what you need to add is uh, what is labeled A, an autopilot, uh, a sensor, what is labeled I, uh, data link, this little uh, purple thing called D, and a payload because uh, you will be flying for a reason. So usually the payload we, that is the most widely used is a camera. And now you have uh, a picture of how it looks in real. So you see it's very simple. In fact, since we have developed this little board, everything is on the board. And so basically you only add this board and this sensor, and you have a UAV. 
uses the controller board. There are two versions. Um, when people start the project and they are on the RSC or on the mailing list, they always wanted to start with the big board. Um, that's not what it's good for. Um, I would always start with the tiny, which is on top. This is the board which does have everything in one board. We have the GPS antenna. This is the brown white thing. Then you have the ARM7 processor. You have the power supply and some more parts on the other side. Uh, this was the, the first design we had, which only had two processors and nothing else. And in the beginning, we had the, we had the two processors separated, like I said, for RC and for navigation. And this was, this was, was th what this board was for. And now with the new software, we hope everything goes right and we put everything into one processor. We have sort of separated spaces for the two processors, but it should be safe. Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, infrared attitude measurements. So in uh, most UAVs, uh, they will use an uh, inertial sensor uh, well, to tell their attitude. Uh, one of the problems with inertial sensors is that they are um, expensive, at least if you want good one. They are very fragile, very difficult to use. You need to calibrate them properly. And you don't get a direct reading from a gyrometer. You get only a rate reading, so you have to integrate that to get your attitude. So you need a fancy filter. This is complicated. Uh, we have uh, in Paparazzi, what, on fixed wing, we use another way to measure attitude. attitude uh, and this is, it consists in uh, thermopiles. So basically, they are uh, just thermometers. Uh, once again, this is consumer uh, electronic stuff. This is used, uh, for example, in, in cars, uh, air conditioning system. And so the, how does that work? Uh, you put one thermometer on each wing of the, air, on the aircraft. If the aircraft is uh, level, they will read the same temperature. And as soon as you bank it, they will read different temperature. So we are here talking about radiation temperature. Uh, the sky is normally very cold, like minus 40 degrees or something like this, and the Earth is normally warmer, mm, not, not always. <laughs> and so uh, you get uh, an estimation, well, you get a measure of a temperature difference that you have to convert, uh, that you can convert into your attitude, but it's a direct reading. So no need to integrate something, no need to calibrate the sensor. And so how do we get the the reading, we add a second pair of vertical sensor and we just take the ratio of the difference of temperature and we get a direct reading. Uh, you? So Me? these are the sensors that we're using. You can find them, for example, in, uh, in ear thermometers that you have. You put in your ear and you can measure the temperature and that's done by measuring the infrared radiation of the, of the body that you want to measure. And so you you can get them very easily. They might be 10 euros, 5 euros, something like that. So uh, just uh, something to add, this is not something we invented. This is something that has been used for years and uh, uh, for uh, since the 60s, for example, for example, uh, in uh, attitude determination in the satellites. We have a GPS, which is on the back side, you see here. We also have the power supply. So this is the tiny board from the other side. Uh, unfortunately, you cannot buy this board anywhere. You have to build your own until now. So we are kind of looking for someone wanting to build these boards. And we're doing this for two years, I think. We have a data link, um, various modems on various frequencies. Usually the XP is very nice. It's on 2.4 gigahertz, so if we have video, we cannot use that. So we have some 800 megahertz modems. Um, and we have a two-way communication so that we can set waypoints or change the flight plan. And this is about all for the hardware. Yeah, just for the modem, uh, there is no uh, perfect, perfect modem. You will choose uh, this peripheral according to your mission. If you want to fly far, then you will have a slightly bigger aircraft. You will be able to carry a slightly bigger modem that will need a little more power, but give you more range, and etc. cetera. Um, now we'll talk about the software uh, architecture. And so Paparazzi uh, is not uh, was not designed as a single piece of software, but as a uh, distributed uh, architecture, a small piece of software talking together. So the core of this architecture is a software bus, bus that is called Ivy, and that allows the application to 
uh, exchange messages. So this is uh, something that offers functionality similar to what we see in Corbar or that kind of thing, but that is much lighter and easier to use. And so here you see the minimal configuration for uh, a ground station, what we have in the laptop here. So you have one process that we call link. This is uh, the hardware gateway. This is where you're going to plug your modem here, and it will make the gateway between the airborne network and the ground segment network. You have this process that is called a server. Well, this is a it does uh, almost everything. It's going to log all the messages that are uh, traveling on the bus so that you are able to replay your flight to uh, analyze it. It will do such thing as uh, sending uh, messages to the third process that we see here, and uh, which is the ground station. So this is only the graphical user interface. Um, so this uh, architecture is very interesting because it's very flexible. Uh, for example, if you will be running a simulator, and you will be running a simulator, it will just plug here uh, in the place of link. And this is exactly the same code than the code that is running in the aircraft. Uh, we, have, we will talk about that later, but we have a good segregation between hardware and non-hardware code. And so we are able to compile the same code for the ARM7 or for the PC, and running the, the flight controller on the PC, exactly as if it was uh, on, the, on the aircraft. And uh, this one, uh, Gaia, is an uh, environment simulator, which will simulate things like uh, wind and GPS coverage, and sort of things. And you can add still more agent. While you are flying, you may want to plot your uh, altitude or whatever, so you it's very easy to plug agents such, like, uh, at, uh, such as a plotter um, or this one, which can replay a log. So, for example, you could have a, well, we could decide to fly, have a real aircraft flying, uh, replay a previous flight at the same time, and have a simulator running. So this is a very flexible architecture that allows uh, a lot of things. So it's like the Unix, you have a lot of small applications. Um, there's also an application just to, saw, to show you the raw messages and you can just plug whatever you want. We also have a plugin for Google Earth, so we can transmit the, the location and the attitude of the aircraft into, into Google Earth and you can see the aircraft fly through Google Earth through this and it just plugs to the Ivy bus and, and that's it. We have a plugin for flight gear, it's very easy to plug stuff. Yeah, like this, if you have a payload, in a special payload in your aircraft, it's very easy to add messages, to write your payload agent. Uh, yeah. So, the onboard software itself is uh, written in C, pretty much. Some of the code that you're um, compiling, like the flight plan, is directly compiled to C and then linked to the software which is running in the aircraft. And uh, it's all the same. C software, which is uh, running in the ARM7 or could run on the old RV airboards or also in the x86 or i386 um, PC simulation. So it's all the same software. It's just compiled differently. We're just starting to play with ARM9 processors, and it would be exactly the same. And you can bring whatever processor you have as long as you rewrite the hardware layer. You'll fly paparazzi on it. The board configuration can be a single and twin processors, but like I said, we're not using the twin processors anymore because we're confident that the one processor system can cope with the whole load, and so we're not using it. But we can still use it if we have some, some real huge aircraft, for example, that we want to make sure that the RC link is still working, we use the two processor boards, and we can still do that right. with the software. You can use this feature also not to uh, segregate uh, different uh, critical code, but uh, if you, for example, you have a process that, is, that needs a lot of CPU power, you can use this feature to uh, unload uh, the intensive task to another processor. Uh, yeah, and this one, it's very uh, configuration independent. Uh, a lot of the code is generated, and so the paparazzi will fly small aircraft like this, bigger aircraft with multi-engine, a lot of actuators. It will fly rotorcraft, uh, whatever you want. Uh, 
uh, it's safe code, so we have, uh, um, it's not all written with formal methods, but the critical code um, has been uh, written using formal method. Uh, Real-time analysis, we are in contact with a couple of universities who do that kind of job and who are very happy to test our code for that. And also extensive testing, we have a, a lot of people flying it, and so the bug don't last very long, usually. And um, also it was written with efficiency in mind. Uh, it means that uh, the program that you load in your aircraft is not a generic program. We have a compile time approach. Everything that can be uh, tested before flight is static. And this is done uh, using code generation. So a big part of the code that is used for the airborne software is just generated. This is the flight plan language. I'm probably not going to into deep too much. It's you can you can write uh, you can set your waypoints on the top. You can have exceptions, so you can change the flow during the flight. This one is doing something else if it goes above 300 meters. You can do loops inside here. So there's a loop, and you can use math, and you can use. Um, any variable you have in the system in flight, so you can do very, very strange flight patterns if you want. You can use the whole, the whole touring. touring uh, what you find in uh, usually other uh, autopilot is that the, the flight, they don't have a real f language to define their flight plan. Mostly you define a couple of points or unsophisticated one, you can define maybe circles. Here you have a complete language to uh, write your flight plan just as a program. So if you want to write a flight plan that does the complicated thing we showed before uh, to mimic the <coughs> biologic behavior, you can write that. This is a Turing uh, complete language. And so whatever you can write, you can write it in this language. Another uh, big point we've worked uh, a lot uh, in the for last year is ergonomy. Um, when you fly one aircraft at a time, you can cope with a badly designed uh, graphical user interface. But as soon as you start uh, having several aircraft in the air, the workload increases exponentially, and you really need um, ergonomic software to help you. So on this picture here, uh, you see that we have five aircraft in the air at a time. So this is a huge workload on the <coughs> operator. Um, so this picture shows a, a screen cap from the ground station from 2003. You see that uh, both, uh, well, okay, you, you see that it's bad. This is a picture from uh, 2005. It has involved, uh, improved a little. And this is a picture from the current ground station. So this is not designed only because it looks cool or because it's practical, but it's designed by uh, people who actually study ergonomy and uh, who study that well. They will uh, come with us, film us while we operate, see what kind of mistake we made, uh, make that kind of paper mock-up, play scenario on that. Uh, yeah, you can... Uh, I think we have to uh, hurry a little. <laughs> make that kind of mock-up, see how we want to, to do things. And then in the end, we code the interface that you, that you have seen. You think I should tell more? No. Mm. We, we don't this, is, this is the interface you had seen. You have a lot of knobs. Um, on the bottom line, you have the um, flight plan. So there's takeoff, you can see. Then there is a go home. That's, that was the standby circle. So it happens a lot of time that you're flying and something very strange happens, like what we were seeing when the aircraft was going up north. And then the thing you do is you click the home button, and the aircraft will come home and circle over you, and the heartbeat will go down a little bit. You can fly figure of eights, you can fly ovals, and all sort of things. There you have the battery, you have the link status that you probably saw going red a little bit after some time. And we have the explanation here. Obviously. And you see uh, the throttle, you see the speed, and we try to make everything in a way that you have the green color saying it's good, the orange color is like, seems okay, and the red color, there's really something going wrong, so that with one view you can see if everything is is all right. And uh, this, none of this is static, of course. Uh, it's written in the flight plan language. 
So if you want to change it, you just write a different flight plan and you can add buttons, add values. Uh, so it's fully programmable. After the flight, you probably want to find out why the aircraft was flying up north or why it was turning upside down and hitting hard on the ground. And what you can do, you can, um, all, the, all the data that you receive during the flight is locked to your hard disk. So you can look at all the data afterwards and you can plot that. And here, for example, you can see the blue dot is what the aircraft wanted to do and the red one is what it actually did. And you can see that it performs very well on this. I'm not sure which one this is, no, but you can control all, the, you can see the loops working or not working, and so you can tune the loops. You, you have to retune each aircraft you're flying. Each aircraft is a little bit different, so you first fly manual, and then you start tuning all the loops, and um, you really need a graphical interface to and do so. You, you do that after the flight, but you can also do it while it flies. Yeah, you can plot that Just during the, the flight. Same. This is some more analysis where you can look in, where you can see an aircraft flying up and down against the wind. And you can see that the turn against the wind was shorter than the turn with the wind. And you can see that the speed increases while it flies with the wind and goes slower after the wind. Uh, yes, no, we have described the hardware, we have described the software, we will uh, quickly talk about the application. So our primary goal when we started Paparazzi was to take part to uh, MAV competitions. And this is the competitions uh, we took part in the last four years, so in fact all of them. And you can see that we performed uh, satisfactory. Uh, no, what, uh, what else do we do? We don't uh, only do um, competitions. Uh, competitions are very cool and this is uh, the main goal, but uh, we also use this for teaching. So uh, as this is free software, some, um, many universities use that uh, for teaching different topics around uh, aeronautics. So here is a list of uh, some universities that are working with us. That we are aware of that they're using it. They're probably more not telling us. Um, another application uh, is uh, for uh, research around uh, aeronautics and UAV. You have seen that uh, UAV is a very complex system, and so when you're doing research in a particular topic, you need the system, but you don't want to build it uh, completely. So you can just use paparazzi and put your little piece in it and do your research easily. So this is, uh, this is a 3D picture from uh, what's done in University of Arizona, I think, and those guys study aerodyn aerodynamics. So they use our autopilot to study in order to study aerodynamics. This is a picture taken in Iceland this year uh, where we were flying with some meteorologists and they had some other aircrafts here on the floor and they had this balloon they let go up and um, Keep this picture in mind, and that's the same picture, uh, just from some further away with Google Earth. And we had a we had a special um, no time issued by the Icelandic air traffic control, so that we were allowed to fly very very high. So we were flying up like 12,000 feet, which is uh, about 3,300 meters. And we're not sure, but probably that that has not been done with a with a small aircraft like this. It took us like six minutes to go up there and that's where we lost telemetry and so we clicked on the come back button because we were not really sure. It's, it's a little strange because you just throw the aircraft and after like 500, 600 meters you just see nothing and all you see is the screen and you're just sitting there and hoping that nothing happens and <laughs> the heartbeat goes up with this. And so uh, you've seen that uh, pap uh, paparazzi can be used uh, for collecting data for other type of research. And what we uh, have seen recently also is some operational applications. So this is uh, for uh, detecting fire forest. We have done things about uh, um, filming waves, uh, finding fishes, uh, and what else? We there are plenty of applications. And now we come to the conclusion to leave you a couple of minutes for questions. So um, what we wanted to say is that the technology is ready. You have seen that this kind of uh, tiny aircraft work, and they work well, they work repeti uh, repetitively. 
there is a huge field of applications for this kind of vehicles. Uh, every week we see a new person coming and say, hey, I, your aircraft are cool, I want to use it for uh, whatever. A lot of things that are done with real aircraft can be uh, done with small aircraft for a cost that is uh, much less. It has advantage in terms of security also because it's small, it won't hurt people. And this brings us to our uh, third point. The biggest problem we have at the moment is that uh, regulation for allowing us to fly is very behind. It's evolving very slowly. So mostly what we are doing is uh, uh, flying under the radio control regulation, which means that we are not supposed to fly out of sight. Uh, recently, we have seen a case where we were able to fly in segregated airspace. So, for example, this uh, experiment with the fireman, it, was, it took place in a controlled, controlled airspace, very busy airplace near Bordeaux. And after about one year of uh, negotiation, we were able to get an area in this, and we had a an air traffic controller on the ground with us, talking with the air traffic control notifying our takeoff, our uh, landing and everything, and all this for the, that kind of uh, aircraft. <laughs> when we were in Iceland, this was a simpler, because you probably know that Iceland is just a little village, and if you did go to school with the right person, it's not that difficult to get an air traffic controller to allow us to fly that high. <laughs> and so obviously, and this is the thing that is missing the most at the moment, is uh, to find a way to uh, have a smooth integration in civil traffic to allow uh, real operational uh, use. Now we want to uh, acknowledge all the people uh, who helped us uh, for, to set up these demonstrations. So you see them here and uh, all the others that uh, we cannot mention here. Uh, finally, should you want further information, uh, yeah, I don't know if we said already, but all this work is uh, free software, so free software, free hardware, free everything, GPL. Uh, so this is a place where you can get more information. And now, if you have any questions, you have two minutes. Hello? Yeah, we, we have uh, only five questions because of the time. So, um, sorry. All right. um, how much uh, does it cost uh, a very basic setup? It costs time. <laughs> if you, if you, uh, the parts, if you're buying the parts for this, let's say 500 euros. If you want to, to uh, if you are making several, it will be cheaper. The, uh, the cost is your time. It will take you months, maybe years. Uh, how accurate is the attitude measurement with these infrared sensors? We have no other reference sensor, so we are not able to tell. What we can tell you is that, uh, judging from the result of the competition, where uh, you got a lot of points for the accuracy of the tra trajectory, we are uh, as accurate, if not more, than the other teams using inertial. I have okay. another question. Um, uh, on which attitude works is this uh, measurement? So works it with uh, low attitude also uh, with high? or? Yeah, you can. If you do the math for calculating this and you calculate that this will, it will still work at 30 kilometers altitude. So it shouldn't, there's, sometimes there's a problem if you're right next to a house or next to a tree very close to a house or a tree, um, that cause problems, but altitude, you will not, you not see that in any altitude that you can fly with such an aircraft uh, where you still have air. If you calculate the horizon, it will not change that much, even in at 30 kilometers altitude, and it will still work. We had no problems uh, at all at three, three kilometers altitude. Um, thank you.
Okay. Uh, what about functional safety? The problem is that normally, if you have such a system, uh, it can cause severe damage. So you have three, have to have three uh, systems that um, test each other, so that if something fails, the, the reserve system gets in. And so this thing should be quite um, dangerous. For example, you, maybe you, you fly in an overcrowded area like the Alexanderplatz or somewhere else, or demonstration or something, and, some, and this thing hits a person, you get a problem. And so this has to be um, improved in regarding functional safety. Yeah. Uh, we, we, um, <laughs> so, so, so we, security, we security is always the most, the most concerned. That's why we're not flying on the Alexanderplatz. And you probably saw in the pictures the places that we were flying at were far outside, far away. And we have two data links up to the aircraft. We have simulated everything before. Of course, this is not the same as the 30 million uh, Global Hawk aircraft that the US Army uses. And still, they crash. And we, we are talking about 300 grams aircraft, so even if they fall on your head, you should not be injured a lot. And yeah, given the size of the aircraft, we cannot double, double or triple every system. Okay. So we are doing our best. We're using formal methods. We're using analysis. And but okay, uh, okay. So but the uh, hard, hardware problems. Um, so, so, so like so, short thing. What about regulations? If you do the thing quite short, so that is a very small aircraft. So maybe the air traffic controller won't even notice that because every plane is tested against birds flying into the turbines. So if that thing is not more, not not, not heavier than a bird, it should be no problem for an airplane. There's yeah. some. That's what we're trying to suggest to the people who do the regulation, but for now they don't really believe us. <laughs> okay. Um, do you think the paparazzi could be a solution to um, citizen surveillance systems that the government could put up? This is the last question. Thank you. Um, so, well, anyone can use this, and I guess it's used already. Still, I think it's a very bad idea to fly with a fast rotating carbon fiber aircraft over human crowds. So that's nothing that we do, and I would not suggest to do that. So. And this is not specifically paparazzi who could threaten, uh, the, the, who could pose this problem. This is all kind of UAV. I think paparazzi uh, sort of solve this problem by giving access uh, to this technology to more people than uh, with commercial uh, material. Thank you.